I believe we have Greg Barnes with us. Greg, can you hear me? Gotcha. Hi, thank you for joining us so much. It's an honor to have you. That's all right, no problem. So I, I wanted to start right off with um, what the Australian political situation is regarding Julian Assange. I know you have a lot of legal expertise, especially in this area. So what do you <clears throat> see happening right now and in the last few months since Julian Assange has been silenced? Well, I wrote a piece uh, which is published on today's Fairfax Media here in Australia, which is a Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, um, making the point that uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, and Julie Bishop, the Foreign Minister, and Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister, to their credit, have not joined in the bang for blood that we've seen from Pompeo and Sessions and co. Uh, I think this provides an opportunity for Australia to uh, play the role of a middle power here and to uh, get the assurance from the United States that it will not seek extradition, uh, that it will allow Julian Assange to leave the embassy uh, and to either come back to Australia or alternatively uh, to uh, safe passage to Ecuador. And so um, what what are some of the changes specifically that you've seen just in the last few weeks um, that if you'd like to comment on them? Well, look, I, I think that the, the situation now, and I, I've certainly had uh, this communication with uh, uh, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, as has Julian's father, which is that the situation is that you've got a person who's now uh, incommunicado, as it were, who's been uh, locked away for six years, coming up for six years. There needs to be an end point. Uh, there needs to be an end point for a range of reasons, but uh, primarily because we've got a human being uh, who's got family in Australia, his, his mother and his father, both of whom I know well, who are terrific people, getting older here in Australia. Uh, and uh, he is an Australian citizen and Australia has an obligation uh, to ensure that its citizens are not facing uh, the prospect of torture. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we were discussing earlier with John Kiriakou is the fact that uh, solitary confinement is torture and that that yep. is a very, very real impact on any human being that goes through that situation. So how did you get involved with such? Can you give the audience a sense of the story as it's, as it's related to yourself in connecting sure. with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and all of that history? Well, I was a strong supporter of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, when the news broke of the uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan revelations. Uh, as uh, I was involved in the Australian Lawyers Alliance, which is a progressive group of lawyers in Australia, uh, and uh, as a key spokesperson for the alliance, we strongly backed Julian Assange's right to freedom of speech, and we were particularly scathing about then Prime Minister Julia Gillard saying that he'd committed criminal acts in Australia, which was probably wrong. Uh, we then gave some briefings to... Uh, various uh, uh, parliamentary committees. Uh, we also, uh, I can say, uh, uh, then uh, continued to agitate on Julian Assange's behalf. I um, was asked to assist Julian when he ran for the Senate in the uh, federal election in 2013. Uh, and I've maintained a close involvement with Julian, both as a lawyer, but also with uh, trying to add some political expertise uh, ever since. And uh, I'm in regular contact uh, with Julian and with uh, members of his family uh, and other members of the legal team. And because of your immense legal expertise, can you please comment for the for the audience uh, on on the injustice of the way that Julian Assange has been treated and the ways that the, the treatment really does go against um, the letter of the law in so many ways? Because I know that that's a huge topic. Well, it, sure. Well, it does in, in a range of ways. Um, firstly, let's, let's say this was just a normal case where a person had skipped bail. Uh, or breach their bail. Uh, they would be dealt with by an English court purely on the basis of, uh, look, uh, we're going to impose a fine, don't do it again, and off you go. Um, that's the first point. That hasn't happened. Uh, the second uh, point that I'd make is the United States has been running a secret grand jury process. And we now know that this is fact, despite the mainstream media uh, continuing to pour scorn on the idea. We now know it's a fact because we've seen the comments in recent times uh, relating to uh, arrest of Julian Assange being a priority. Uh, so we have a person uh, who has had to, the only way that they could stay safe, the only way that they could prevent being uh, refooled, to use the immigration term, to uh, the United States was to seek refuge uh, and seek asylum. Now, normally when a person seeks asylum, there is... Uh, so there are some diplomatic niceties which take place globally because all countries know that they could be in this situation one day. 
And a person is allowed safe access, for example, to medical care, which has not been allowed by the British here. Uh, and uh, they're also allowed uh, safe access to the airport so they can go to the country from which they, um, uh, uh, they have sought asylum. The, the UK government's uh, conduct has been appalling. I mean, for a, for a government and for a country which pur purports to uphold the rule of law, uh, the conduct has been uh, well short of that. So uh, that's, the, that's the, the legal landscape, if you like. I mean, I have to say, I think at the end of the day, this has now become a, a completely political issue. And like a lot of these legal issues where you're involving people who are seen as political, it is a political solution in the end. And we've seen that in Australia with a number of people in China, for example, who've been caught up in the Chinese legal system and being detained, the solution at the end of the day has not been legal. The solution has been political. Uh, and that's not to criticise uh, my colleagues or myself in any way. But at the end of the day, um, the the courts work within a framework. Uh, that framework can really only be shifted, I think, with political goodwill. That's, that's really important for our audience to hear, um, you know, somebody with your uh, expertise legally to say that it is it is up to us to fight for Julian Assange is really, mm. really impactful. It's a message that people truly need to understand. So um, from your perspective, what are some of the ways that the audience can actively and tangibly help Julian Assange and WikiLeaks right now in the best way possible? Well, I think, I think bu building momentum, uh, uh, particularly amongst younger voters, uh, I'll give you an example. In Australia, uh, over 10 years ago now, David Hicks, who was a young Australian who went to uh, uh, allegedly fight with Al-Qaeda, uh, effectively found himself uh, on the wrong side of the, the war in 2002 or one or two, was taken to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, most people didn't have a lot of time for David Hicks, but what they didn't have a lot of time for was the Australian government allowing a fellow citizen to be palpably tortured at Guantanamo Bay. And it was, it was young voters particularly uh, and, uh, and getting online and getting really active and harassing MPs, I mean in a civil fashion, but harassing MPs to get change. And it eventually built up enough momentum that was a very conservative government of John Howard that brought him home. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think I think that a lot of times supporters of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks underestimate their own power in this situation and the ability they have to, to really actually change the situation with something that seems to a lot of people to not amount to much to tweet at... Uh, their representative to send letters. But from what you're saying, that is incredibly important and incredibly well, I, I necessary. In no, I mean, I worked in politics for, for 12 years as a political advisor. Politicians react to volume. Uh, they react uh, in democracies. They, they react to volume. Uh, when they see uh, in their electorate office uh, uh, a huge number of letters and uh, emails and tweets coming in, when they saw them coming in for David Hicks, they knew, as they would say, it was a barbecue stopper conversation. In other words, the average Joe was talking about this on the weekend. It wasn't just activists. And I think that's uh, very important with Julian. If you talk to Julian about Julian to people, and, you know, I do it regularly, most people say, yeah, it is pretty unfair. Australia should be doing something. And we need a lot more of that because the Australian government is instrumental to this. At the end of the day, he's an Australian citizen. Yes, he's an Ecuadorian citizen, but he has not renounced his Australian citizenship. He's got family ties here, strong ties to this jurisdiction. Not only that, Australia purports to have some leverage uh, over the UK and Washington because it's a strong ally of both. It's in a perfect position, but it will need a strong campaign on behalf of Australians, but not only Australians, people around the world uh, saying to the Australian government, do something. And I know that um, in the last few days, I've seen a number of tweets from WikiLeaks and I believe WikiLeaks Task Force and the Julian Assange Twitter account to the effect of a, a lot of activity going on on the ground with young people and college students, university students who are protesting and acting for Assange. Can you give any perspective on like the um, the the mood in Australia? Like, how much are yeah. Australian citizens aware and supportive of Assange? Well, I don't think enough. I, in fact, I had a meeting with a really bright young guy the other day who's uh, involved in a young uh, tech startup here in, uh, in in Australia, in Melbourne. He made a really good point about the, the Assange support base in Australia. It needs more younger voters, under 30 voters, and he's right. Uh, and I think one of the reasons you haven't got it is because it's gone on so long. Uh, Julian, and, and the mainstream media in Australia, quite frankly, has been disgraceful in the treatment of the Assange case. My article today is about the first time, and you know, it's to the credit of Fairfax Media that they ran it, 
Uh, it's about the first time Assange has uh, had an opportunity to present to the mainstream media. I know, I think, Elizabeth, you did an interview this morning with Ross Cameron on Sky. Uh, and that's uh, I think because I didn't get out of bed early enough and he said he'd got you, so well done, <laughs> uh, which was great. Um, it was an honour to speak with him. That was definitely... No, no, it was great because more honor. voices are better. And see, he's coming from a sort of right-wing perspective and he's, he's, uh, he's a Murdoch uh, media outlet. So we, today we covered Murdoch and Fairfax, the two big media outlets, but it needs the journalists to be following up questions with as they did with David Hicks. You know, we had Canberra press gallery journalists, the, the, the political journalists with Hicks saying... Prime Minister, what have you done? We need those sorts of questions being asked by uh, journalists uh, in Australia of the Prime Minister and the opposition leader. Well, see, that's the interesting thing. So why? what is the difference between something like Bill Hicks and this case? Why is it that those same journalists are not speaking out for Assange? Has something changed in the situation where they've become more indebted to the unelected power structure? Or is it just that they don't feel for Assange? What What do you think? Uh, look, I, I, it's, it's a really good question. You know, David Hicks... Uh, had a strong following in the in the mainstream media. Uh, outrageously, there are some journalists in Australia who don't like Assange. Uh, a journalist for whom I have a great deal of respect once said to me, you've got to understand most of the journalists in Canberra in Australia's capital hate Assange because he does their job better than they do. Uh, and there's some truth in that. Yeah, but, that jealousy uh, might be an unexamined aspect of this that people don't... Yeah, and, 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 and look, I, I think, and, you know, you get snide remarks from journalists, uh, uh, you know, leading journalists in Australia about Assange. But can I say this about it? Um, uh, what they need doing is focusing on the fact that you have an Australian citizen who is being subjected to torture and will be subjected to torture if he is allowed to be extradited to Washington. That's what they should focus on. Forget about Julian Assange, the journalist. As I said in the in, in uh, the age today. You don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to support Assange, but you do have to su support a principle that says the Australian government has an obligation to ensure that its citizens are not subjected to torture. And it's, uh, that's why this vigil is so fantastic. I mean, we have you on, we have Ross Cameron on, two Australians from different maybe ends of the political spectrum, and you're yeah, both... Yeah, I mean, Ross and I work that. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ro yeah. Ross, Ross comes from an, uh, the, other, the other side. Um, Although my, uh, I started life in the Liberal Party but left over the policy, uh, cruel policies towards asylum seekers. But, look, there are people uh, in Canberra, uh, are politicians who, have, uh, who, are, who are very good on the Assange issue. There are also some people who are outrageously bad. But um, I have to say, in fairness to the Prime Minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, who I've known for a long time, I ran the Republic campaign for him here in 1999. Um, he's been circumspect about the matter. He has shown interest in the matter when I've raised it with him. Uh, and uh, he hasn't, as I said, joined in the sort of blood-curdling cries that we've seen from the Trump administration uh, or Hillary Clinton, for that matter, about uh, Julian. That's very, very interesting, and it definitely raises some sort of possibility of hope that if there is an increased uh, level of pressure from uh, college students, from from people within Australia on the Prime Minister, that maybe there's some hope that they would actually take action for Assange. And that's some really good news that um, we have so much bad news uh, with Julian and with WikiLeaks at the moment. Um, we have smears. There's all sorts of stuff that is really unfortunate. But hearing that is, is at least something that people can um, grab yeah. hold of. Uh, yeah, and, and look, uh, you know, I don't want to overrate it. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. work to do. There's an election yeah. coming up here any time really from now until the middle of next year. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other the other pressure point, of course, is in the Senate. The Australian Senate works on the basis that it's, it's an elected body. It's a bit like the US Senate. Um, the government needs its support to pass bills. We're urging senators, particularly what we call crossbench senators, senators who don't belong to the major parties, to be saying to the Prime Minister, uh, look, uh, I'll support uh, your legislation uh, if I see that you're serious about doing something for Julian Assange. Yeah, making that such a uh, you know top priority is definitely something that has to happen. Um, from your perspective, what what can viewers do? Um, let's say in the US or from outside Australia, um, can there be any impact from outside Australia on the uh, Australian support for Assange, or do you think that people should basically focus on efforts in their own countries? Oh no, look, I think I think uh, pressure on the Australian government. When Hicks was around as an issue, I remember there were people in the United States uh, putting pressure on Australia. I think particularly when Americans do it, uh, it has resonance here. Uh, and people in the UK, when they do it, it has resonance here. So uh, uh, there's um, there's certainly an opportunity for people to be saying to Australia, you know, play, you can play a very constructive part in a resolution of this matter. Absolutely.
Absolutely. And so um, are there any aspects of Assange's legal case and the, the persecution of WikiLeaks that you think um, has not been effectively reported by the press? I, I mean, like really has not been given any light of day that you'd like to tell our audience about? Oh, look, I think that the legal team in London, uh, uh, my colleagues over there have done a tremendous job uh, in uh, very difficult circumstances. Uh, I, I think that the reporting of the cases themselves has been okay. But I'm surprised that, uh, for example, the, the UN Working Group on uh, Arbitrary Detention, uh, when it reported, uh, it did get some press, but then it died away very, very quickly. I mean, this is a very distinguished body, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, it includes some of the best international and human rights law scholars in the world. It's not, in other words, a political UN organisation like some organisations. In other words, it's effectively a distinguished court with people who are not political making judgments. Uh, and I've been surprised at how Australian uh, journalists have uh, not continued to pick that up and say, look, this UN working this this UN working group is a very distinguished, apolitical, uh, non-partisan group. It has been um, very clear in what it has said. You have an Australian who's been arbitrarily detained. Uh, Australia needs to do something about it. As, by the way, uh, Australia regularly does with uh, people who get caught in Bali with drugs or uh, get uh, yes. caught in China. Yes, um, I'm aware of some of those really um, horror stories in that sub yeah. on that subject, definitely. And uh, the, yeah, I think that the it's also been interesting. I remember recently there was the UK um, ruling against Assange's legal team, uh, you know, you included, yeah. that uh, basically it dismissed the United Nations uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, and it was it was extremely flippant. And I wondered if you had any comment on that. And, uh, I think it was a. Yeah. I think it was a very narrow judgment, a very black letter law judgment. You know, I'll say this tragically. I think some of uh, my colleagues and uh, some uh, judicial officers take a very black and white uh, view of the law, and uh, what is required is uh, some imaginative uh, judicial decision making. Uh, and uh, good judges make decisions and make sure that justice gets accorded in cases. I think that's what I'll say about it. Yeah, well, thank you so much for um, just kind of expanding on that a little bit. Um, other than the United Nations uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, um, are there any um, aspects of the rulings that have been in Assange's favour that have not been reported on? I mean, I know that we've seen that the, uh, the media definitely dismisses the United Nations uh, Working Group's ruling, but is there anything else that they also dismiss that you'd like to raise? With us, well, I think they, I, I think they have been extraordinarily uh, uninquiring or lacking in inquiry, if I can put it that way. Uh, when uh, um, uh, they haven't continued to pursue the Americans over the secret uh, grand jury processes, I mean, the bottom line is that the United States uh, has been pursuing a secret grand jury process over Assange for a long period of time, and yet there's been a reluctance on the part of the mainstream media uh, to pursue that. I, th I think the other issue is that this is a human rights issue. Uh, and the problem is people have conflated it. Uh, they've said, I don't like Julian Assange. I don't like what he's doing. Uh, therefore, I'm not going to see it as a human rights issue. Human rights are human rights, um, irrespective uh, of whom that person is. In fact, you know, sensibly, I had, a, I had a judicial officer in this country the other day, nothing to do with the case, but we were chatting about Assange. And he said to me, he said, look, I'm not a great fan of Julian, but what is happening is outrageous. And I said, you get it. You understand it. It's, about, it's not about whether you support Julian or don't. Uh, uh, in this sense, it's actually about the human rights of an individual uh, and making sure those rights are respected. Absolutely. And when you discussed just now um, the way that the press has not followed up on the massive mobilisation of, of the US government, multiple agencies against Assange, um, I myself was really surprised to see the extent of the reporting on that initially in 2010 that has now just mm -hmm. dropped off the radar completely. So I was wondering if you could walk through for us um, and the audience the history of the case legally for uh, surrounding Assange and WikiLeaks, you know, just a breakdown of how this has developed um, since 2010. Well, uh, others can probably do a better job than me, but I, I can say, you know, certainly since 2010, there have been, there have been, they must have spent uh, uh, literally now hundreds of millions of dollars, US Department of Justice in pursuing this matter, looking at espionage charges. Uh, they got Manning uh, in the most disgraceful circumstances and a very unjust process, uh, but they're continuing to pursue the matter. Now, uh, they've done so in secrecy, which uh, uh, makes a mockery uh, 
of, uh, again, a country which says we believe in a system of open justice. Um, this has been a deception on the American people. It's been a deception on uh, Julian Assange and his legal team. Uh, there have been uh, uh, no other uh, nations, now that Sweden has dropped out of the picture, there are no other nations uh, that are so um, uh, bloodthirsty, if I can put it that way, in their pursuit of Julian Assange as we see uh, from uh, uh, the United States. I can say uh, the Australian government, there are no legal actions in Australia, uh, to my knowledge. In fact, he committed no breaches of Australian law, and that was put to bed very early on. Uh, there have been no breaches of UK law. There have been no breaches of US law. But the United States uh, is determined, uh, and I think being allied uh, with uh, some uh, journalists who are prepared to do its dirty work uh, in pursuing an anti-Assange agenda. I mean, you'd have to say, uh, if Julian Assange were tried in a US court uh, with a jury, uh, whether or not he would have any chance of a fair trial because the polluting of the waters in the United States by the many, many members of the mainstream media, particularly uh, CNN and Washington Post and others, well, not so much Washington Post, but New York Times and others, uh, and uh, working hand in glove with the Department of Justice, uh, it seems, um, would make it extremely difficult. Absolutely. And so can you walk us through a little bit of how it developed this the, uh, from 2010 onwards? I know that we saw, but our viewers may not be familiar with the all of government efforts that were launched and mobilized against yep. WikiLeaks. Can you describe that a little bit? And really like, well, the, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so in addition to pursuing espionage charges on the basis of leaks of material and publication, uh, they also uh, decided to close down the donations uh, regime uh, so that people couldn't uh, fund WikiLeaks. So here we have an NGO in, in the form of WikiLeaks where the US government uh, took uh, action and made threats to banks, uh, credit card companies, uh, you name it, uh, they did it. Uh, and uh, that's continued. So we had that as well. Uh, and then we've had, uh, there's no doubt, US uh, working assiduously with the British to make sure that Julian Assange's rights, normal rights, for example, the right to health care, uh, which he can't exercise because he can't leave the embassy without the threat of arrest, that the, the, the usual diplomatic forms and conventions which apply to uh, persons who seek asylum have not been honoured. So it's been a relentless pursuit by the United States Department of Justice and both sides of politics. I mean, Hillary Clinton uh, has, was appalling uh, on the Assange issue, uh, as is Jeff Sessions, uh, as is uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, as is uh, uh, Representative Adam Schiff, uh, in the uh, who's looking at so-called Russian activities. Now, you know, there's been a complete, uh, for, for your listeners, there's been a complete absence of any fairness or uh, respect for the rule of law. I mean, normally uh, one should be circumspect uh, if there is a suspect in a case uh, I'm not saying Julian's a suspect, but certainly if there's a person that police want to speak to uh, or authorities want to speak to, they should be circumspect about it, not running it through the newspapers, not running it through the media, not running it through the Congress, not running it politically. But this has been a completely political exercise on the part of the United States legal and uh, espionage establishment uh, to get a person uh, who was doing no more than other journalists do, and that is to publish materials uh, which uh, the state doesn't want to see published. Absolutely. And I have a question here from Twitter um, that says, is there what, like, it says, is there any hope of Julian Assange being reconnected? And I would add to that, uh, it, what is the level of hope that you see for Assange being reconnected in the near future? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I noticed the comments of President Moreno uh, the other day, uh, which, look, and, and those who are, uh, more closely advising in London should answer this, but certainly uh, uh, one would have thought that uh, at the very least, and here again is something I think the Australian government could do. Uh, it could, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister, could pick up the phone to President Moreno and say, look, this guy's an Australian citizen. He is entitled uh, when he seeks asylum to the ordinary rights of other citizens of Ecuador. That includes rights to the internet. Uh, there ought to be a compromise here. Um, uh, these things are always capable of compromise when one party takes a particularly swift and harsh action, uh, and one would hope that uh, there is some compromise reached. But I know John Pilger, uh, amongst others, has been sceptical about President Moreno and uh, 
uh, and his uh, close ties to the United States. And look, you know, once again, all roads here do lead to the United States. Uh, so in part, the answer to the question is this depends on the United States. Very, very um, important for people to understand that and the importance then of raising, um, you know, support for Assange in the US for sure. And another question I have is about the um, the sort of collusion between the US and the um, Swedish authorities to um, it, regarding the, the investigation, which is now dropped, because that is one of the huge um you know, smears that is leveled against Assange is in regards yep. to that. So I'd like if you could explain exactly how that stands and exactly the extent to which that was a farce and a facade, that would be fantastic. I think people sure. um, need to sure. hear that. So, so the, the way the Swedish system works, uh, the, the, a prosecutor has the right to, uh, to issue uh, an arrest warrant uh, to uh, speak to a person about allegations before they're charged. Uh, I might say that the English courts uh, and a number of other courts have been uh, very, very um, uh, not so much hostile but uh, quizzical about that uh, power because normally you can only uh, arrest someone if you're going to charge them. Uh, and certainly. I'd like to just jump in and say I want to correct myself. I, I uh, misspoke. I said US and Swedish. I meant UK and Swedish. Yeah, UK and Swedish. Just slipped my mind. Yes, I, 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 sorry. Jim, um, look, the, the other point is that... Uh, uh, the prosecutor in Sweden refused to come to London to interview Julian, uh, despite the fact that Sweden regularly and routinely does it, and despite the fact, by the way, the Australian police, as I made the point here to the media, Australian police often go overseas to speak with people uh, and interview people. The, the person does not have to come to Australia. She refused to do so. Uh, she continued this case despite there being a, a, a real level of concern about uh, this case uh, uh, in the Swedish legal profession, including amongst her colleagues. And the United Kingdom, as we now know from uh, documents uh, from the Crown Prosecution Service, I think behaved disgracefully. I think that um, what we had was a case where lawyers were acting in a very political fashion. Some might say, and I probably do too, the law is always political, but this was overtly political, overtly running the agendas uh, or political agendas or diplomatic agendas uh, when their only concern should have been fairness to the person uh, in respect of whom uh, they sought to speak, uh, and uh, and and uh, closing off the investigation as quickly as possible, either by charging or discharging. But uh, what we saw here was uh, a very political uh, delays. Uh, the British telling uh, the prosecutor in Sweden not to come to London. It's appalling conduct. If prosecutors did that here. Uh, and it was found out, uh, there'd certainly be ethics committees and uh, others having a look at their conduct, and uh, rightly so. Yeah, and, and to uh, um, you know, remind our viewers, for those who don't have the context with these particular documents that you're mentioning um, regarding the Crown Prosecution Service, those were um, won by uh, Stephanie Marizzi, an amazing journalist who was able to publish those as a result of a Freedom of Information Act um, issue. So I know that some of our viewers will be familiar, some may not be. Um, the other thing that I was wondering, from your perspective, um, as a legal representative of Julian Assange in Australia, um, one of the aspects that I've noticed does not doesn't seem to be remembered by people is this connection between the prosecutor of Julian Assange in the UK and the Pinochet case, and then same with uh, you know uh, his um, lawyer Gazon, who has uh, obviously was a, prosecuting against. Uh, Pinochet, can you can you bring this story to life for people who may, maybe never well, heard about it or forgot about it? Sure. So Augusto Pinochet was a Chilean dictator, for those who are uh, young enough not to remember him. Lucky you. Um, uh, he then uh, ended up fleeing to London in the early 1990s from memory. Uh, and uh, uh, there were demands that he return to uh, uh, Chile. But he was, in effect... Uh, allowed to remain in London, uh, he was interviewed, uh, and uh, in fact there were uh, there was uh, English uh, court proceedings uh, around Pinochet and around uh, the question as to whether or not prosecutors should come to him as opposed to prosecutor as opposed to him having to go to Chile, and so uh, the Swedish prosecutor seems to have forgotten, uh, and uh, Marion Nye seemed to have forget some of those fundamental principles uh, in Julian Assange's case. 
Yeah, you definitely. Um, I thought it was uh, timely to bring up because you see the, not only the role, role reversal in terms of the individual lawyers themselves, but definitely um, the hypocrisy when we see we yeah. know that Assange is suffering medically and he's not um, allowed to have medical care versus somebody who was involved. Oh, uh, that is extremely. Yeah, look, I, I, you know, yeah. I should I should I should add that the 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 other aspect of Pinochet was that Pinochet was effectively given um, rolled gold treatment by the United Kingdom government, uh, the government of Margaret Thatcher and then uh, John Major, and um, in fact uh, Mrs Thatcher was a great supporter of uh, Gusto Pinochet. Uh, I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, and and look, there are other examples. Um, there are other examples of people who have uh, fled uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, because uh, uh, of uh, investigations, they've gone to other jurisdictions and they have been treated um, very well. So what it says, what does it say to you? Well, what it says to you is that countries such as the UK, which purport to uphold the rule of law and say that the law applies equally to everyone, um, are talking through their hats because uh, that's not the case. Uh, it's clearly not the case. And we've seen that in the Assange case um, uh, writ large, as it were. Absolutely. And I think that the fact that that type of history is not talked about consistently is one of the things that really hides the level to which it's so clear that he's a political prisoner. Um, and that's... I, and I, I, I could not agree more. I mean, there's no doubt he's a political prisoner. And if Julian Assange, for example, uh, had, uh, you know, revealed uh, caches of documents from uh, Beijing or from uh, uh, Moscow or wherever, uh, he would be fated uh, as a hero. Uh, I can say to you, in Australia, for example, where there's an extraordinary level of paranoia about China at the moment, journalists are regularly getting feeds from security agencies and revealing, uh, allegedly revealing various aspects of Chinese policy. They're not being arrested. They're being fated as heroes uh, within Australia and uh, presumably by uh, the US uh, embassy in Canberra, uh, whereas because Julian Assange reveals the truth, about what happened in two appalling walls, in which Australia was a very active participant, uh, he gets punished. So, as I say, the, the rule of law either applies or it doesn't apply. But the next time you hear Theresa May or uh, any other politician talk about the commitment in liberal democracy to the rule of law, uh, you should take it with a grain of salt. Absolutely. And um, from your perspective, what has been the harm ag uh, against the public in terms of the funds spent policing the embassy, in terms of the, the energy uh, of, of public funds used to prosecute and to um, you know, police Julian Assange? Um, what does that do to the public? Um, how does that harm them and not just Julian and WikiLeaks? Well, I think it harms the public by saying these are tens, of, and, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars spent on pursuing a person whose only crime, in inverted commas, uh, has been to publish documents that the government doesn't want published. Uh, how many hospitals, how many schools, uh, how many kids who need care can that support? Uh, and I think, I think rightly people in a democracy get very sick and tired of the security state uh, and uh, police and others uh, pursuing with a vengeance people. Uh, when uh, that money could be much better spent uh, on effectively uh, caring uh, for the people of that particular jurisdiction. And if I was a, per if I was a citizen of the UK, I'd be mighty pissed off, uh, to use the vernacular, uh, with the fact that hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent there rather than my kid's school, where you've got teachers, for example, as happens in Australia, putting their hands in their own pockets to buy equipment for the kids because there's not enough money. You know, as a matter of equity and fairness in society, uh, this pursuit uh, is uh, outrageous. Absolutely. And you mentioned the security state. And I think in a lot of ways, maybe especially recently, we've seen that the security state does seem to, you know, reach across the Atlantic between the US and the UK. And I was wondering if I could get your comment on um, the UK and the US working together um, to extradite Julian Assange to the US for an unfair well, prosecution. I've got, I've, got, I've got no doubt. I've got no doubt that they work closely together. Uh, the U.S. is part of the five eyes for your, uh, for your uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, that is uh, Australia, the U.K., I think Canada, New Zealand. Uh, I left one out, but uh, there are there are we, we we got four out of the five. I can't remember the yeah. fifth one, but effectively there is a, an intelligence sharing agreement between all those countries. They all work hand in glove. Although I have to say about New Zealand, uh, it has a very principled prime minister. It uh, is very prepared to stand up to the United States and has been for many, many years. It's a pity Julian Assange is not a New Zealander because he, if he were, uh, 
I can tell you now, Jacinda Ardern, who was recently in London, would have raised the case with Theresa May and uh, certainly there would be much greater support. But uh, uh, unfortunately, he's not a New Zealander and uh, he's an Australian. But those, those the security agencies uh, and uh, police agencies of all those countries in the five eyes, uh, they uh, share information, they work hand in glove on extradition. There's absolutely no doubt the United Kingdom uh, would be playing a role. Absolutely. And I have a, a question from a viewer from Glenn McGrath, who says, uh, Julian's bail, fa uh, a bail appeal failed in February. Can and will that result be challenged? And I thought that you'd be uh, uniquely uh, uh, able I, to I, answer that. I don't think it has been. I, I haven't spoken to uh, my colleagues in London about it uh, as to whether or not uh, it would be challenged. I don't think it has been. And I suspect the appeal has run out. But look, if there is other news on that, uh, please let me know. But I, I'm not aware of it. Difficult often to appeal those sorts of rulings because at the end of the day, it depends on the discretion exercised by the court. And what appeal courts say is, look, as long as the discretion wasn't outrageous, um, even though we may not have decided the same way, we're not going to overturn the decision. So it's difficult to appeal those sorts of decisions. Absolutely. And so, um, and, and going back to just in the early months of this year, we all learned that Ecuador had given, and this is completely, you know, changing subjects pretty drastically, but we learned that uh, Ecuador had not only given Assange citizenship, but they had also given him diplomatic status. So can you explain how it is that the UK was able to basically ignore that designation uh, in regards to Assange? And if that well, was that, actually, yeah. Yeah, a, a country does not have to accept uh, diplomatic status. So when you are a diplomat uh, and you go to a country, uh, you have to present your credentials. Um, I think is the term that's used. Certainly ambassadors need to do that and other senior diplomatic staff. And uh, a country doesn't have to accept. Uh, a country can say, we're not going to accept that person. Uh, and the United Kingdom stood on its ground, its diplomatic ground in doing that. Uh, I might say in uh, circumstances where it would have been a very neat uh, outcome, I would have thought, for Theresa May uh, and the United Kingdom government to say, well, yes, we'll accept it. And therefore, he, as because he has diplomatic status, he can leave the embassy with that immunity, uh, go to the airport and go to Ecuador. Uh, but I think if there's any clearer indication that the United Kingdom is working actively with the United States at the government level to have him extradited, that was the test, because that was an elegant solution. Uh, it was uh, a fair solution but it wasn't taken up by the UK government. And I think what that shows is the UK government uh, is just as uh, bloody-minded about this issue as the United States. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and I have another question from a viewer that sort of, um, sort of uh, moves on from that question. It's from Tristan sure. Sykes, and it's, he said, is there any way to enforce uh, the UN ruling for Assange being um, illegally detained or arbitrarily detained, it, or is international law and human rights effectively toothless in the face of Pax Americana? And I think that goes exactly to the previous issue well, I, of I, the diplomatic yeah, community. He, unfortunately, he's right. Um, the great problem of international law, whether you be dealing with Wales or Julian Assange, is that uh, the enforceability of rulings depend on the goodwill of governments. We've seen in Australia, I do a lot of work for refugees here, we've seen in Australia a number of United Nations ruling uh, condemning Australia's cruelty towards refugees, asylum seekers. The Australian government has taken no notice of it. Uh, and uh, the same with Japan when it came to Wales in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and uh, the same when it comes to Julian Assange. Uh, of course, it does show the gross hypocrisy uh, of uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, uh, the system works because countries do like to accept, uh, they do like to accept international law rulings when it suits them, but not on other occasions. And that, uh, and Tristan Sykes actually has another question leading on from that saying, are there any legal consequences for the bad act, for these bad actors in failing to apply that law? And I think you've pretty much answered that, but I thought I would. I think I've answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely yeah. leads on from that. Um, and do you have any, I, I know that the, uh, though Assange is in basically solitary confinement, he does have access to his legal team. Is there any um, update on his um, you know, current status that you're willing to give us or able to give us? Um, because people are very worried about uh, Julian yeah, Assange and they he, really he, want to hear. He's, he's remarkably resilient, remarkably resilient. Most of us would have gone stark raving mad. Um, but uh, there needs to be an end point. Uh, to this, you can't have a person living in a small apartment in London with no access to natural light forever and a day. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I know that a lot of our viewers have asked um, how he is, how he's holding up. So I'm glad to hear that 
he is as resilient as ever. That's really a positive uh, piece of news. So um, I'm just looking through the the social media questions we've been given. So I've just sure. answered one of them. But um, so again, and this returns to something we've already discussed a little bit. But um, Angel Renee asks, what are the chances that Australia gonna, would stand up for Assange? Phone, I can hear my phone ring, but I'm going to keep okay. you on. Not a problem. Screening. Not a problem. I'm just I'm just looking through these questions. It's not. Yeah. not it's a good time for that type of um, interruption, I suppose. So sure. um, actually, uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, titling themselves Navigator One Anne asked, "If I left uh, Julian Assange or WikiLeaks something in my will, where could I send a copy to?" Um, I don't know if that's something that you've <laughs> dealt with, but um, sorry. So 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 the question is, if I've if left. I've left Assange something or WikiLeaks something in my will, where do I send a copy of that to? I don't know if... if oh, that's a very good question. Um, Julian probably has the answer to that. And um, if that person wants to get in touch with me, uh, just send me a direct message, DM me, or uh, I'll, I'll see what I can find out. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I thought that um, as a legal representative of, of Julian, that would definitely be the question to ask you. Um, and then this relates to his uh, how he's doing. Uh, Harold Hedge asks if he's getting good food, and uh, again, if you can uh, provide any news on him. And I understand oh, look, I, that. Yeah, oh, look, I, th I think the problem is Elizabeth that you, you know it doesn't matter about your nutrition, it doesn't matter what exercise you're getting. Um, a, a person who's been arbitrarily detained uh, without any natural light for six years is going to suffer. I mean, I do a lot of work for prisoners, even those in solitary confinement, which uh, as tragically occurs uh, in Australia, uh, would get at least an hour out of their cell each day. So these conditions are worse than are endured by any prisoner in the world. That's such an important uh, topic because I think that so many people dismiss what he's going through because they misunderstand the yeah. um, the, the the effect of solitary confinement and the yeah. the situation that he's in. They really it's yeah. not I mean, understood well. Is, solitary confinement is unlawful uh, as a matter of international law. Uh, it's unlawful in some countries which actually care to uh, document and enforce human rights. Um, but uh, he is effectively in a solitary confinement situation. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's such a small amount of time that can make such a medical difference in these situations. Yeah. So, for example, the limit, uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but the limit uh, legally when solitary confinement is labelled torture is just 15 days. And as we know, Julian is, has now been through quadruple that limit. So, um, exactly. and, and exactly. the other, the other uh, question I have for you that's related to that is, uh, and we've mentioned this previously in the stream, but I want to ask you, um, Assange, uh, WikiLeaks has published medical reports uh, on Julian Assange in, from, I believe, 2015. And in those reports, he was already, it seems, suffering some ill effects of isolation at that time. So I was wondering about your perspective on just the, the level of effect that isolation has, even, when it, even prior to the current uh, solitary confinement and just how uh, serious that well, is so our viewers sure. understand. I mean, I, I'm not a doctor, but you, you don't have to be a doctor to know that, and, and certainly I've acted for prisoners who've had endured very harsh conditions and refugees and others. Uh, detention is hard. Detention physically and mentally harms people, whether it's one day or, you know, 20,000 days. Uh, the tension is a form of punishment and uh, it does harm people. And the longer a person is detained, uh, the longer they're forced to live in, in uh, an environment or exist in an environment uh, that is inherently deleterious, uh, the greater the suffering and the greater the harm uh, to themselves. Uh, and that's no different for Julian as it is for any other person. Absolutely. But as it's worse in this sense that he's got no natural light and, uh, uh, that, uh, I think, is quite appalling that the United Kingdom government wouldn't even, for example, uh, countenance uh, an arrangement where he could, for example, you know, walk out, to, uh, you know, even if they want to put him in handcuffs, uh, you know, walk out and uh, down the street and, and round the block each day as a form of exercise. I mean, sheer humanity would tell you that you should do that, but it seems that sheer humanity uh, is sadly missing in this whole Absolutely. Cycle. And that seems to be actually a weapon. Um, that inability itself seems to be something um, from just observing it that they're trying to, um, you know, force him to lead the embassy through methods. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's a form of cruelty to say, uh, we're, go we're going to make conditions so horrific uh, that we want you to leave. Mind you, the Australian government does that to asylum seekers on Nauru and Manus Island. 
we will make these conditions so hellish uh, that you'll give up uh, your fight and you'll just head back to Iran or Afghanistan where, you know, you'll be killed. It's the same sick logic uh, in play. We definitely see that a lot as well in the US um, prison system. There's a lot of yeah, absolutely. awful, absolutely. yeah, awful treatment. Yeah. But um, but in returning to the embassy itself, um, we uh, since Julian Assange has been cut off from communications this lo- this uh, time, people are asking constantly, and I know that this is something that cannot be done. But people are asking, you know, can we somehow get him internet from outside if we make a hot? You know, there are over and over yeah. again we have people ask yeah. us that. So can you explain well, to audience so they can understand? It. Can they? Yeah, can, they so can. You can't. Yeah. You can't. I mean, I'm exactly. not a tech. I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a tech expert. Yeah, so I, I know, but I, as well. But but it's as I understand it, the system's completely jammed. Um, yeah. I remember when I was over there in 2013, spent some time with him, and I was going to use my phone to do something. He said, "Don't bother because uh, it just gets scrambled. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's surveilled and jammed to within an inch of its life." And uh, speaking of being surveilled as well, I know that uh, The Guardian released um, a number of hit pieces against Assange, and part of that was that um, that his his um, legal team's meetings uh, with him had been surveilled and recorded. Um, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that you wanted to share on how... Well, uh, on the, the, the Guardian's conduct, uh, I think, was appalling. I mean, it's odd that a newspaper which purports to be progressive purports to support uh, freedom of speech uh, and reports in particular to be opposed to uh, torture and uh, unlawful detention uh, would decide to spend so much time and effort in what were palpably, you know, cheap journalistic shots. Um, can I say in relation to surveillance of legal meetings, that is unlawful. Yeah, uh, legal meetings are privileged. Uh, any lawyer who has a meeting with a client, those meetings are privileged and you are not allowed to, it's a breach of law to surveil them, let alone to bug them. It's certainly a breach of law even to surveil them. Absolutely. And that is such an important... I mean, there are so many aspects of this that do not receive, obviously, enough attention. And and the gravity of these um, facets of the persecution of Assange um, is so underestimated, I think, by so many people. Yeah. Um, are yeah. there any other aspects of the case or of the current situation that you want to update our viewers on or to encourage no, them to I- act in any way? Sure. I think, Elizabeth, just to go back, to to finish off, just to go back to what we talked about at the start, I really urge particularly younger Australians who who are watching this, New Zealanders, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, you know, um, get onto Twitter. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull is uh, tech savvy, our Prime Minister. He's got his own uh, Twitter. I think it's Turnbull uh, Malcolm. It's a simple one like that. Uh, Get onto that, not with abuse, uh, but constructively saying, hey, big chance here. Uh, to uh, for Australia to help a citizen who really, really needs that support. Uh, they can retweet uh, my article today from the Fairfax Media. Uh, they can... Um, um, I'm Barnes Greg. Uh, my, it's my Twitter feed, B-A-R-N-S, no E. Um, there's a guy in Texas actually called uh, Greg Barnes with the same spelling, and uh, he, and, he and I get... Uh, he's a storm chaser. He chases Texas storms. So sometimes I get these... Uh, Hey, great, great storm chase, Greg. And I don't know what they're talking about. Then I get it. But anyway, I'm Barnes, Greg, not Greg Barnes. So Barnes, Greg. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and and email the Prime Minister's office. Uh, yeah. The leader of the opposition, Bill Shorten, same thing. I mean, Labor needs to join in on this as well, the, the opposition. They will possibly be the government here next year. So Bill Shorten, the opposition leader. Penny Wong, the opposition shadow uh, spokesperson. Julie Bishop, the foreign minister. You know, you've got to really hammer these people. But as I say, not with abuse, but just, uh, you know, this is an Australian citizen who needs uh, assistance in the same way many Australian citizens need assistance. He's got to get it uh, because uh, that's your duty as a government. Absolutely. And that goes to um, that actually answers a question that I had not asked uh, from Greg, uh, which uh, asks how we can help convince Malcolm Turnbull to explore diplomatic options. And do we write tweet blogs? So that definitely answers that yeah. uh, that question. For I think sure. also in London, uh, if you're in London, you know, go to the Australian High Commission. Uh, George Brandis, who's now the High Commissioner, is a former Attorney General here. He knows all. To, he knows this case very well, very well. Uh, he didn't do anything on it when he was Attorney General, but he is now the Australian High Commissioner in London. You know, get on to the Australian High Commission, hammer them, because they've done nothing, uh, partly because Alexander Downer was there, who's extremely conservative uh, and a supporter of the United States. Uh, Brandis likes to see himself more as a small-l liberal, as a, as a more genuine liberal than conservative. Uh, 
Well, let's see, George, if uh, you as the Australian High Commissioner, uh, with the number one detainee in the United Kingdom, uh, whether you can actually uh, put into effect some of the principles you say you've got. Uh, and uh, Australians and others uh, in the United Kingdom should be going to the Australian High Commission, getting in touch with the Australian High Commission and, and really putting pressure on Brandis and, as High Commissioner to act. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of that type of action and reaching out and letter writing, tweeting and all of that, um, I know that the Assange legal team and one of the, especially one of the uh, Twitter accounts at Assange legal recently put out a post, I believe in the last two days that was encouraging um, supporters of WikiLeaks to not only talk to their representatives and everything that we've already, already discussed in this segment, but also to put pressure on humanitarian NGOs, you know, press freedom, yeah. all of the NGOs that should be supporting yeah. Assange, but should aren't. Be supporting. I mean, and am Amnesty, I mean, Amnesty uh, should be supporting this cause uh, you know, uh, uh, Reporters Without Borders, you know, Human Rights Watch, this should be bread and butter for them. Uh, leave aside the fact that they mightn't always agree with Julian Assange. That's not the point. I mean, I've had people say to me, for example, I, you know, I don't like his attitude to Hillary Clinton. Too bad. I mean, that's, you know, leave, you know, leave that at the front door, come in, have a discussion uh, and, uh, and, and see this as a humanitarian issue. Uh, if we're going to just pick and choose who we support on the basis of their politics, then uh, that's not what uh, human rights is all about. And uh, it, it shows a great deal of hypocrisy on the part of those who purport to support human rights. Absolutely. And I think that uh, if, if any of the viewers and listeners want to access the template that justiceforassange.com has, um, I will later, or, or if my tech helpers could please link that to the to the chats for us, that would be fantastic because that was right. a really important document that was provided. There's a template yeah, you can use. I agree, Elizabeth. I agree. Yeah, yeah so, I agree. Um, I think that was important to mention and highlight for people for sure. So um, are there any final thoughts you think going forward? What do you see um, in the next couple of weeks and months as far as any changes from Ecuador specifically in this case? What, what is your kind well, of forecast okay, look, with this? I, look, I, think the, I think the first thing is, you know, get internet restored, uh, come to an agreement with Julian uh, in relation to that. Uh, but moving forward, there does need to be uh, a quite clear pathway for Julian to be safe. Uh, and uh, the time to do that is now because... Uh, Things are coming to a head, uh, and you can't. The current situation is uh, unsustainable. Absolutely, and we know that Lenin Moreno, the current president of Ecuador, has has called the situation unsustainable. But at that time, he was trying to negotiate that uh, yeah. what you call yeah. elegant solution to get Assange out. So yeah. um, very important. Uh, uh, I, I totally agree, and, and thank you, thank you for the time today, Elizabeth, and uh, well done on this initiative. I think it's so important. Uh, to hear uh, these voices. I heard your previous speaker and uh, uh, as you rightly said, uh, what's interesting about the Assange issue is that it does encapsulate people from across the globe, from different perspectives, it unites them. Absolutely. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. And um, thank you so, so much for speaking with us. And again, thank Greg, it, Greg, I just want to tell, say that Greg is, is a legal representative of Julian Assange in Australia. And we are so lucky that you have joined us and spoken to us and explained some of these legal issues that are either not known about, like the Pinochet issue, or are uh, misrepresented um, in other issues and facets of this. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.